Hello viewers and welcome to a new STM32 tutorial video. In an earlier video, uh, and let me just check which one that was, um, number five to be exactly, I introduced the possibility of debugging STM32 applications in the actual hardware using an ST-Link. A device which can can debug information and flash. Uh, now the ST-Link device comes in many forms. Uh, one of the oldest ones was the original. I believe ST call it the ST-Link version 2, which is quite common and not overly expensive. I have always personally despised this device. Um, for two reasons. First of all, it is using a mini USB port and I don't remember the last time I used a mini USB and I most certainly don't have any cables lying around that fit it, so I have to f fit a special cable for it a second time. Um, the other thing I really find annoying is that they have this big white box uh, with a lot of pins uh, and they didn't bother to put explanation and pin names on it, I, I simply don't understand why. But the result is that if I want to use this device, I have to do a Google search and find the pin out every single time, and that just annoys the crap out of me. So I have actually tended to use these ST-Link V2 devices out of China. These are Chinese clones, uh, and they actually work fairly okay. Um, and as you can see in this picture, I actually bought quite a I, I think I bought 10 from some supplier at some point. They didn't cost much, uh, probably only about a dollar a pop when I bought them. Um, and they're kind of okay. Now, what is not okay with these Chinese knockoffs is that they only provide two of the cell wire debug lines, the clock and the SVIO. There is actually a third signal, SWO. I believe that stands for Serial Wire Output. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, and it is actually possible to modify these devices uh, to include that uh, ST-Link um, at SVO. I think that will be enough. And there is a, uh, maybe you should ST link uh, hacking. I think there is an article here on uh, EEV block uh, that show how this can be done. And it is done by adding a wire to the pin header. That is all that it takes. But these Chinese knockoff clones uh, never include that by themselves. Now, that was actually my original reason of creating my own STM32 programmer, which I have documented here. It is deliberately made to have the same form factor. In fact, it fits into this aluminum sleeve uh, from the Chinese knockoffs, so I can actually replace them. But contrary to the Chinese, if you look at my schematics, uh, bump. <coughs> I need to zoom in a bit on that. Uh, you can see that I include the, first of all, I include serial communication. So this can be a serial dongle as well as uh, a debug device, uh, but I also include this SWO signal. And in today's video, this is the one we will be focusing on. Now, I will not actually be using uh, my standalone programmer uh, that is documented here because I am using for these videos at the moment. I up oh, sorry wrong link. I am using my uh, STM32 world boards, uh, and I am using two boards for this video. I'm using a CPU board which includes an STM32F405 uh, MCU 
and I am using my programmer. I have deliberately not called that ST-Link, but it is exactly the same as a standalone ST-Link device. Um, and those two together will have all the features that we need for this video. So let's start looking at what we have. I have created, as usual, a new project, uh, which I call STM32World uh, underscore SWO. We start at exactly the same framework that I have introduced in the last 18 videos, where I have a main loop that keeps track of how many times it goes through the loop, loop and every second it will print out a statement that show how much it has executed on the serial port. Now, if we look at the output from that, this is how it looks. We have seen, I have introduced that in an earlier video and we, you've all seen that if you've seen any of these videos. But if we look at the configuration of the CPU, under the system core system, we are using serial wire debug, but you will notice here that there is another option called trace asynchronous uh, serial wire. I assume that is standing for, and all that does is it enables an extra pin on PB3, which is called SWO. The other two pins included in the debugging remains the same. We can go back to the serial wire. These two remains exactly the same, but it just adds an extra pin. So let's try to generate this code. In our source code, we are overriding an internal function called write. And in that write function, we are sending everything out. So the UART1, which is the one we have enabled, if we look at this, connectivity UART1 is the one we're using for the cell communication here. But it is actually possible to, we, we, we ignore the file descriptor in this, but if we actually look at this file descriptor, we could redirect uh, another file descriptor to a uh, and uh, to uh, a debug the SVO port, and I have actually, I have as usual cheated a little. Uh, wait, uh, let me copy it, and I'll explain what I'm doing here. Uh, oops, oops, there we go. So now I'm looking at the file descriptor. The standard file descriptors in any of these applications, there is a standard out and there's a standard error. Standard out is file descriptor one and standard error is file descriptor two. So what we're doing here is if it's one, we're doing exactly the same as we did before. But if it is two, I'll use this function called itm centchar. And what that does is if we look at the explanation, you can see it there. It transmit a character via the itm channel zero. Uh, and that is about it. Uh, contrary to this one, where I can send the whole uh, buffer in one go, uh, here we have to pass one character at a time. It doesn't matter, actually, because it is really, really fast. So if we run this application now, it will run exactly like it did before. Why didn't that happen? There we go. There is no change at all. But you will notice down here that we are actually using printf. Printf by default always print out to file descriptor one, which is the standard uh, output. But we can use another one, which is called fprintf, where we print to a specific file. And here we can choose to, if we do uh, std out, it is exactly the same. Let's try that. There we go. But we could choose to send this to STD error instead. Now, if we do this, 
notice up here we still have another printf statement that prints out to the standard output but if we run this one you'll see it starts but there is no tick because the tick is now not being sent to the UART but to this itm sent char function so how do we actually use that now that will only work when we're actually debugging the application, not when we are running it standard. But if we start the debugger here, you can see that down here we have, I have added a couple of, well, let's, uh, well, I have already added them. Uh, if you don't have these, uh, you can uh, add in window show view SWV you have the data console and you have the statistical profiling. I have added both of those. Now, in order to use this, we will have to do two things. We have to go into the settings of this debugger and we have to add channel zero. So let's do that first. We just add, normally it's like this. We just add that and then we have to click this one it is a little bit hard to see, but normally it's like that. And if we click on it, it will be slightly blue around it. And you can see now it is actually capturing. So if we are running now, you will see that we get our output here rather than on the sail port. The sail port only showed the starting, but the rest of it goes here. Now, if of course we can, we can change, um, we could change this to, uh, let's stop that. Uh, we could change that to, uh, we could change this one to fprintf to uh, std error. There. Let's start the debugging. Let's switch to our data console. It is already enabled, so we can just resume execution. And now we have the starting there as well, as well as the tick variable. So that is a way to actually avoid using a UART and a serial dongle to get your information just with that one signal, the SVO signal. This actually have other features that are, I actually forgot to mention one thing. Let me just rectify this because I already did it. When we go into the debug configuration by default, debugger tab, uh, the sale wire viewer is not enabled uh, here. So we have to enable that sale wire viewer and that one needs to know the core clock of your CPU. That That is all that is required. Now, when we do this, let's uh, go into the settings again. We have the option of enabling uh, PC sampling uh, I think that is all that is needed. And then run the application again. Now you can see we have our output here. Uh, but if we pause it, uh, okay, that wasn't enough. Sorry. <laughs> what happened here? Let's try to run the debugger again. We might have to enable that one as well. Let's try this. So uh, we continue. You can see our data is coming there. And if we pause, yeah, we get a breakdown of profiling of the X entire uh, application. And you can see that it is spending a little bit of time in our ITM center, but 99.99% of the time of this application is currently spent in the main function, which is down here in the while loop. So that is two very, very strong features uh, to, to, to be able to see in the earlier variable i showed how to watch variables uh, you can see when i'm pausing if i continue and pause again you can see it will show 
Uh, that's a bit weird. Let's try running it again. I don't know what is happening there. <laughs> we have, uh, so let's run. And let's pause. Anyway, we can monitor the variables. We can also monitor live expressions. Uh, we can look at our uw tick variable. And when we're running now, that will actually update while the software is running. In the MCU, we can still have our sale wire debug, and we should also be possible to update the statistics. See the, the actual statistical data down here. So that is uh, some of, oh, it's still running. Let's pause it. There we go. We we'll see now it actually, it changed a little bit, the statistics, but it's still spending 99.96% .96 of the time in that loop. I don't know why that changed. Anyway, so that is just a short introduction to some of the more interesting debug features. I think one of the only things that I have not um, introduced yet is it is possible to add a, a, a conditional breakpoint, but I will get back to that in a later video. I think this is about enough for today. As usual, please like and subscribe. And uh, I really do read all the comments. So if you have any comments, uh, please put them down below. Uh, and uh, if you have any requests of something I didn't explain well enough, uh, remember I'm still pretty new at this and I am still learning and I'm very eager to make these videos better. So. Uh, let me know what you think and what you think could be improved. Have a wonderful rest of the day.